Ivan, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you. To start, if you could maybe just give a little bit of background on you and your art practice for anyone who maybe is not already familiar with it. I'm an artist. Uh, I'm primarily known as a conceptual artist, uh, sometimes as a queer artist, sometimes as a Latino artist. Um, I kind of just like artists because it's all mixed up anyway. And sure, you can look at things through a specific lens, but I think it's much more interesting when you eat the whole thing, mm. right? I know that you're currently involved, you're employed by um, a nonprofit in Soho called The Door mm -hmm. as the coordinator of HIV services, working, right. working mostly with youth on sex education initiatives mm -hmm. and also the co-chair of the HIV planning group, which right. works with prevention under the city. Coming from a really fine art background, educational background, I wonder how you made the transition into that line of work. When I got here, I was able to get jobs as an art handler and doing installation. Um, but then I was sort of like behind the scenes in the art world. Mm -hmm. And I sort of got to see like, just like dumb shit that happens, right? The petty mm -hmm. kind of nonsense within any field. And so I had a friend who worked for an AIDS agency and he kept telling me to apply that there was a job working with young people basically doing sex ed. Mm -hmm. You know, I had my own HIV education just from being like a young gay person. Like I came out in 87 when I was 14, um, which is when I had my first sexual experience, like of my own volition, and also when I became naturalized. Oh, wow. And all of that becomes a hot mess because in order to become a citizen back then, you had to pass your HIV test. If you didn't, you got deported. So I remember taking that test and like I had just had like anonymous sex, like in a public space. Uh, I had convinced myself I had HIV. Um, and I hadn't lived in Mexico. I came when I was two and a half. So I remember thinking like, if this test comes back positive, I have to tell my parents I'm gay. Uh, I have to tell them I had dirty sex. Uh, I'm gonna get deported and I'm gonna live somewhere I've never lived before. And so I started working at a place called the Hispanic AIDS Forum in the South Bronx, um, primarily with high school aged uh, LGBT youth. Uh, teaching them about uh, HIV and STDs. It seems like that work too has a lot of overlap in your art practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think specifically of the piece that you did that's called There But For The Grace Of God Go. Um, there But um, For The Grace Of God Go I. Oh, Go I. Yeah, I think that piece is, is really interesting. Um, I, I, yeah, I love the inception and idea of it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit too about how you navigated working on something like that right. and like the logistics of that inside of like a museum context or oh, a different sort of yeah. institution. I mean, in some ways, it's my favorite piece because of that. Because essentially what it is, it's, it's like a health intervention, right? But yeah. through the language and the sort of structure of art. The way it came about is I was invited to participate in a show about disco. Um, and kind of its effect on culture. I was like, well, HIV was the era of basically silent transmission. Mm -hmm. It's when everyone was running around fucking, doing cocaine, and just like having a good time. It's like post-sexual liberation, post-birth control. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it was, a, it was a beautiful time for people. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't know that they were giving each other HIV, right? And so my idea behind that project was like, well, let's invite HIV to the, to the party, mm -hmm. right? Let's make it a thing and see what happens. Mm -hmm. The way I want it to function is to invite a local organization to come in and do the testing. Okay. Um, so then it would be a community-based project mm -hmm. in that way, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really about community. Mm -hmm. um, and also for the, the HIV agency, it becomes a beautiful way to do outreach mm -hmm. in a non-traditional space. Then it also is a way to talk about the relationship between HIV and art. And in particular, like art and activism, right? So if you think about early, like what happened during like the early days of HIV, right? And the way the art community was both decimated and also reacted against it. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which I know that you, as you mentioned, you don't 
exhibit in commercial galleries. You, you only exhibit in museums or nonprofit spaces, um, which, which I really love. And, and seems like a sustainable practice because also you've built your life to have this employment. And yeah, and I've negotiated things for myself. I mean, I think I chose the role of, of an artist mm. because it in some ways provides you the most freedom. Mm. And it's why I've chose a practice outside of the commercial world. Mm. No one tells me what to do. I have a job, and yeah. that job pays for my projects. Felix Gonzalez Torres was really kind of a big influence in many ways in, in, in kind of embracing that kind of freedom, right? You give away things, right? You do candy piles, paper piles. But I think that's why I also like nonprofits and museums, because it's the one place where you, they have their rules, but for the most part, part of their goal is to give you that kind of freedom, right? right? because it's not dependent on the marketplace in that way. Yeah. Or even like when I teach, right? Like I taught a, a performance class at Cooper and one of the things I ask the students as sort of like a challenge is like, try and make something out of nothing. Like what does that look like? There but for the grace of God go I is just a series of emails and phone conversations. Sometimes at in-person meetings and we all come to an agreement and then we all decide to show up at you know, at one space at a particular time. But in yeah. terms of like materials, mm -hmm. you know, I just need a phone and mm -hmm. maybe a metro card to go to a meeting. Yeah. And that's the project. Uh, you have a project called Mexicans, um, yeah. which consists of you, when you're in specifically art social spaces and there's three or more Mexican people in a room, you'll photograph them? Yeah, I'll take a photograph with them. With or them. have a photograph taken of us, yeah. Yeah, and that runs parallel with your Mexicans only piece, which consists of regular hosted dinner parties and potlucks to celebrate Mexican culture and community. Yeah. I love these pieces. When I first heard you speak about them, I've talked about them endlessly with lots of people. I think it's so interesting. <laughs> and so I really I really love them. And so that I, project, by the way, makes people very angry. Oh, really? Mexicans only in particular. Wow, that's interesting. So, yeah. It's I'd the love... word only. Okay, oh. So I'd love to, to hear you talk about the inception of it. I know mm -hmm. it's just recently finished. It was. It looks like a 10 year project. Yeah. So maybe the, how it ended. The way Mexican o Mexicans only happened is um, I actually had just moved here to this neighborhood, uh, New York 2002. I could not find Mexican food. The person I was in grad school with was like, oh, I'll take you to this great Mexican restaurant. She took me to San Loco, and I had like a fucking like, I didn't even know what it was. I took one bite and I spit it out, and I'm like, I would rather go to Taco Bell. <laughs> like, to be honest with you, like Taco Bell is more flavorful wow. than this stuff. Wow. So I found myself having to cook a lot. And also, uh, it was influenced by being Mexican on the East Coast. So being Mexican on the West Coast is a very different experience. The West Coast was Mexico, mm -hmm. right? So you grow, I grew up with a certain kind of centrality in my identity that here got disrupted because I found out that Mexicans were like the last immigrants to arrive. And so in terms of like immigrant hierarchies, uh, when I started working for this Latino organization, like. You know, I had other Latinos, like Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, like try and talk down to me because I was Mexican, because of this hierarchy. Oftentimes in this country, really, when you talk about race relations, you're talking about white and black. And sort of like the brown gets, becomes sort of a little bit invisible in that way. Um, I like talking about race in terms of culture. So I lived in Long, in Long Island City at the time. I had a backyard, you know, it was, very sweet and I invited all the Mexicans I knew mm -hmm. um, and I think the first one was like five or six people mm -hmm. um, and it just became this beautiful thing where the only the only sort of instructions were um, you had to identify as Mexican anytime people feel excluded yeah. it gets a little tricky right yeah. but then I make the argument of like you know, safe spaces, the idea of an affinity group, like in social, in the social work world, when the, anytime there's a conference, they actually hold spaces for different groups. So they'll have a trans group, or a trans room, they'll have a youth room, they'll have a room for people that are living with HIV. You know what I mean? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like people then get to meet each other and sort of build community. It's also like Mexicans aren't one thing. We're all kinds of things. And so that to me is exciting too because a, a big part of what happens during the evening is 
us trying to figure out what kind of Mexican are you. So it's been going on for 10 years. Uh, this was the last year. Um, Why did you stop it? I don't know, because it was 10 years. 10 years is a long time. Uh, there's also places I can get Mexican food now, yeah. especially in my neighborhood. And it's okay for things to end. Mm -hmm. So I think we're ready to go into oh, shit. the very last, very last. Oh, sorry, I get nervous. Fuck, Mary kill. Interpret it however you wish. Um, Ai Weiwei, mm -hmm. Gordon Parks, okay. Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, I'd probably kill uh, Mr. Wei Wei, and then fuck Gordon Parks. Well, I don't know. It gets a little tricky because mm -hmm. I know I'm not Felix Gonzalez Torres's type, right? <laughs> so I don't know if our marriage would be so great that way. But it could be an open marriage. I don't know. Yeah. So I'd probably marry him. Yeah. He's really cute too. Oh yeah. He's hairy. <laughs> I like hairy guys. So.